To worship something is to prize it above everything else, to honor it as a thing of highest importance and to act accordingly. Worship is also when we give our deepest affections and highest praise to something. With God, true worship is when we love him with all of our heart, soul, and strength. It is when we put God above everything else in our lives and put God first in our hearts. Deuteronomy 6, 4-5 through says, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Adoration is having an attitude of worship characterized by love and reverence towards God. An example of adoration and worship is in Exodus 15, 1 through 2. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Our focus of adoration is power. Having power can come in many different forms, and the definition of it is kind of vague, but the two most common ones that will be seen is when someone has authority over another person or when someone has influence over another person. Examples that can be found in everyday life is the relationship between a CEO versus one of the employees. The CEO will have way more influence over the company and have more decisions to make, whereas the employee will simply be reporting back to the CEO and following whatever rules are set by the company. Another example is a governing body versus a civilian. The government will have the ability to make laws and rules that the civilian will have to follow, which ultimately impacts their everyday life. Um, society may push people to worship power, and according to the U.S. Department of Justice, the misuse of a position of power is to take unjust advantage of individuals, organizations, or governments. And the question with that arises, is why would someone worship power to the point of abuse? Some of the points are relatively similar to each other, but it comes down to wanting to have an advantage over someone, um, whether it's to get money, to deceitfully get a promotion or something like that in order to be in better standings. It also can be because other people like to control other people, which can be seen in toxic relationships. And going back to the first point, there's this concept that society pushes on people that if you're not at the top, then you're not good enough. So then people will go out of their way to commit wrongdoings in order to be in better standings than they were at first at. To better understand human dignity, Christians advocate for the cherishment of all life because their standard of, standard of ethics. As Genesis 1 explains, so God created mankind in his own image. This reflects God's characteristics onto man, that we are created in the likeness of God, making life sacred and worthy of respect and dignity. The ideal purpose of humanity, as a reflection of God's image, we are created in order to love and follow God, while also treating others with respect and dignity. Both Adam and Eve were given tasks to look and care for the animals. Moreover, human life is a gift from God, and our ideal purpose is to live alongside God and do as he wishes. As Psalms 57.2 says, I cry out to God most high, who God who fills, fulfills his purpose for me. But what does it mean to be human in the Christian worldview? We must first look at our creator, because before truly understanding what it means to be human, we have to look back at God. So looking at Genesis 1.27, um, it shows us how, we are, how God is the source of our identity, and that we reflect the image of God. This is to better understand our origins and allows us to be human. We also have a soul, emotions, and uniqueness, and this different and this and these encompass different characteristics of what God intended for us. Dehumanization is a lack of love, respect, and care for others as God would have loved them. When this occurs, it leads to the deprivation of basic human needs. This includes our physical, mental, and social needs through love, care, affection, affirmations, or other forms of God's love. The two quotes on the Bible help to describe these as they discuss proper forms of care while also discussing the power of love in a positive way. Dehumanization works with power because power is something that is achieved, no matter the cost, to achieve false happiness. An example would be a wealthy person believing that money and the pursuit of money equated power. Power can also lead to the dehumanization of human subjects because when one has power over others, people's free will focuses on their own desires. Actions can be taken to prevent this, but the influence of power leads to dehumanization not as an incidental result of derogation. Also, that dehumanization from power occurs in the impact of original sin and the hold it has over us. This coincides with the two other quotes because of how it discusses the effects and deliberation of abuses. Different forms of suffering, such as death and pain in childbirth, childbirth and work, are a result of original sin that have become today's actual sin. And then here are our slides. Thank you.